So I'm Beth Hyland. I'm with Len LaBar. It's May 22nd, 2015 at the Radisson and Corning. And it's Glass Fest, and Len has joined me to talk about his career at Steuben and the Corning Museum of Glass, and even earlier in Glass. So thank you very much for joining me. Sure. Um, let's start with some easy ones. Just what's your name? Len LaBar. And where and when were you born? I was born on August 4th, 1950 in Bath, New York. And did you grow up there? I grew up in, uh, up on the hill out of uh, Risingville, which is in Steuben County out on the other side of Campbell and Thurston. Uh, then we moved, when I was uh, 10 years old, we moved to Savona, so I grew, so I went to school at Campbell School for a while, then I went to school at Savona. I graduated from Savona Central School. And what jobs have you had? Well, I spent two years in the Army. Okay. And uh, I worked in, when I was in high school, I worked at the, uh, the movie theater, the, the drive-in theater up the bath. And then I went, got, went in the Army right after I got out of high school. And I got out and I got hired by Corning and Corp, or well, Corning, at that time it was Corning Glassworks in 1972, October. I got, that, that fall I got hired. Nice. So what were you doing there to begin with? Well, the, uh, after I got hired, they, they put me right into the, what they call the A factory hand shops. We uh, worked off of 1A tank which is right where headquarters building is now. And uh, it was all hand-blown glass, all Pyrex. We made laboratory ware, acid bottles. I even made uh, blood bottles. Back oh, then wow. they used blood bottles. And uh, I did a little bit of everything uh, in, in there. Uh, how much detail do you want me to go about a factory? Anything you think might be interesting? It, it, well, it was very, very interesting. I, I was fascinated by it. Um, the, um, it was a huge tank. The tank, um, 1A tank, was like 260,000 pounds of glass. I can describe the tank like a, like a barn with a dome roof oh, wow. on it. Actually, when they did tank repairs, they could it was big enough inside that they could drive the fork trucks right inside. And so it was more like they, a swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> if they had a major repair. And uh, they had a, a platform and the glass, the glass was worked and blown mostly on the platform. And uh, off the platform was the molds. Um, everything was blown, just about everything was blown in a mold. I had one job that I worked on that wasn't blown in a mold. Everything else was blown, mold blown. And we made, uh, like I said, I'm, I made, I worked on what they called a German system shop for a while, which is nine, nine guys. And uh, you had a, somebody making a, a small ball, a small gather of glass. And uh, another guy would hold it. He was called a ball holder. And he would hold them and cool them and blow them to size for depending on what, what we were making. Uh, if we were making something bigger, I would gather a, more glass. And if it was, you know, something small, then I'd gather less glass. And and he would blow it up to the size, the, the cover, what was called a cover. The, a guy would take, take this ball of glass after it cooled down to probably a thousand degrees, I'm saying. Um, and then he would cover over top of it and get more glass. And then we had a guy that would strictly just block the glass for the gaffer, you know, keep it turning. We, the molds were all made out of metal, and they were coated with uh, charcoal and linseed oil and a cork. And they would heat it up so the cork would uh, be affixed right to the linseed oil and charcoal. It was powdered powdered charcoal mixed with linseed oil, so it was like a, almost like a paint. Huh. And, uh, we would, he would hand it to the gaffer, he would take it over to the gaffer, and then the gaffer would blow it into the, pre-shape it, and then go right into the mold. 
and uh, then they usually had a, somebody there to blow behind him to keep it keep it in the mold so it would keep its shape so it wouldn't collapse. Otherwise, if it was too hot, it would lose it. it would be lose its shape. And uh, most of the molds had water r running on the outside. They had water jackets on them to cool the glass quicker. They were in pretty constant use. And you had a mold holder. Somebody always opened and closed in the mold. And when it was cool enough, he would open it up just uh, by experience. You know, you, after you make a few, you realize when it's cold enough and the gaffer's coming right behind you with another piece. We worked on piece work. We got paid by the piece. Or uh, some of the jobs didn't pay very much, so they would call it, we called it day work. And we just would, we had a standard we had to make, like maybe we'd have to make like 700 pieces in eight hours. And if it was piece work, a lot of times on some of the jobs, we'd make a 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 pieces in, uh, in eight hours. And uh, we had these baskets that ran around the whole, the whole shop. And uh, the, the tank was like a spider at the end. It had these, like these little tunnels the glass would throw, flow through, and it would go into what they called a four bay. And then in there they had a ring a ring in there and so the glass when you gathered the glass actually you could throw a little bit of your glass over the ring to keep it clean in the center so you wouldn't oh. get blisters and stuff like that and this i think uh it had let's see one two three four five six seven i think there was seven or eight four bays on the front of the tank so it looked like uh, spider legs if you could look at it from the top and look down that's interesting yeah and uh, the four bays each had a temperature control, so you could run it, the, your glass hotter or cooler, whatever you wanted. If you had a bigger job on where you had to gather more glass, you would run your glass colder so you could pick up more glass. The smaller jobs, we would run it hotter because um, the glass quality was always better if we run the glass really hot. Plus, uh, you, you know, you didn't, you didn't need as much glass, so. And we gathered everything on irons. They were the old irons. Today they're made out of stainless steel. Back then they were cold rolled steel. And they, the guys told me they were nickel plated. Nickel was maybe something else mixed too. And the heads of them would actually uh, weren't nickel plated. And they would eventually wear out. They would, they would burn away. And they would just cut, out, cut them off and weld new heads on the ends of them. And they were hollow, hollow all the way through, sure. just to blow irons. And they had a rubber rubber handle on them. Different sizes for different Yep, we had jobs. all different sized irons. If you had a, a small job on you, the, the head of it would be smaller. The whole iron would usually be smaller. Um, if you had a bigger job on, you'd use the big irons. We actually had, uh, in this very center of the tank, they had what they called the big shop but they made all the really big jobs. And they actually had wooden handled irons that had huge heads on them. These irons themselves were weighed, um, I'm guessing 10, 12 pounds, just the iron, before you start gathering glass on it. That's crazy. <laughs> they were huge. And they used to make a lot of big pieces. They would make big bottles, uh, big acid bottles, 12 gallons. And uh, they would make, uh, they had a, a job called 18 by 30. It was 18 inches around and it was 30 inches tall after they cut it. So before that it was, a, you had a lot of, the glass on the iron was called the moil. And uh, you always had a lot of glass left on your moil. So they were really heavy. And they had used a bar, two guys on a bar to pick it up, to put it, lower it down in the block and to raise it up out of the block for the cover and that 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 big jobs like that took two balls of glass to get it started they would make a the one one guy would be he was called a small ball maker he would make a small ball of glass and get a blow of air in it and it had to be straight the air bubble or it would be lopsided it'd be have too much glass on one side and then another guy would take that and cover over that 
then hand it to the ball holder and he would blow out the size and then the the cover the main cover would cover over that and they were big they had uh, as big as 12 inch blocks big cast iron or cast iron blocks and uh, it was they were, all the blocks were in tubs of water the water they would use uh, um, powdered charcoal and soap they would just ivory they drop uh, bars of ivory soap in there to help lubricate the, the block <laughs> and the water was hot they would heat it up so it was hot all the time of course oh. once you got going it'd be hot anyway that's true yeah. Any so other we, tools that? And then then we would take the take it over to the gaffer, and they would uh, the gaffer would the only tools the gaffers really used in a factory were the mold. They they were, everything was mold blown, so you had a, a board they used to cut like a neck in. They would just lay it lay it on a board. The board had a hollow spots cut in it, and they would lay it down there, and it would turn it and pull back, and it would work the neck down smaller. So it would fit in a mold. Depends what what you were making. Sure. If um, the the bottles, the big twelve gallon bottles that that were made uh, had to weigh twenty five pounds, and we used to make them twenty seven just to make sure we were there. And they had quality control. They had a person going around every so often, like every every half hour, every forty five minutes, and they would check the quality quality of the glass, they would check uh, the weight, and they would check, they had these little meters they used to read the wall thickness. Wow. But the gaffer could pretty much tell the wall thickness when the piece of glass come out of the mold. If it was uh, heavy on one side and not the other, the one side would be red, and the other side would be, you could tell it was cold, so then you'd know it was. Just or if it was too one. much, if the bottom was really hot, and the top was cold, then you knew that you weren't getting enough glass up towards the top. Up, but your neck would be too light. So it was quite a trick. Yeah. It was quite a skill, and it was hard work, and it was hot. <laughs> the uh, the only air air we had was um, it came right from outside, uh, out by the river. They had this big fan room, and they used to have these big filters around it. They had a huge fan in there, and they had a these big pipes and they'd pipe the air out to us and then they had these all these little pipes that you could move move around like furnace pipes sure and you could put the air where you wanted it you could have it blown on your face most of the times we had it blown on our hands because of the the heat on our hands no air conditioning no I just came right the guys the older guys used to kid around and say it was uh, the cool air off the river because <laughs> the river is right, right there behind that's us. True. <laughs> and that's you worked in there eight hours, and you knew you did a day's work. There was a lot of a lot of skill and a lot of a lot of hardworking people. We had two shifts. We worked uh, eight to four and four to midnight. And there was um, I think there was like sixty six people on each shift. Mostly men. We had one one woman that worked uh, down on the floor for quite a while uh, in there. But most of it's it was noisy and it's hot and there's air blowing all over. So it's really not an attractive job to just not a lot of a lot of women that really really wanted to go out there and work. I don't think you know it wasn't, but it paid good. It was. It was good money. The, they had two presses where they used to hand press the glass. They would uh, gather gather the glass on what they called a putty head. Putty head it was just made of clay on a long rod with a wooden handle on it. Huh. And they would drop it in the mold, and the gaffer would have a handle. You know, pull the handle down and press out the, the piece. They used to make uh, sterilizer trays, like in hospitals. Sure that had the uh, stainless steel covers on them, street domes, a lot of that stuff was all made made by hand. And it was piecework. They used to make good money uh, making that stuff on the presses. 
Then the small presses made the stoppers. You ever see these little little uh, stoppers in like on a on a board with a lot of little funnels and uh, tubing and stuff? And they had these little stoppers where they could stop the flow of some some sure. liquid and have it run a different direction. And so they used to make those, and they made them. They would take one gather, and they it depends on the size of the stoppers. But some of those stoppers were like there was like 24 and it was like a big looked like a big spider and they would just crack off the little spiders off the end and then in the center was where the the plunger come down and then it would squeeze the glass out into these into this mold and make these little stoppers it would just crack them off and then we would recycle the the inside it would be that, you know, what an interesting design. Would go down, <laughs> would go down, sell, would go down cellar into these big tubs, big, big tubs of water, and it would recycle that glass. What glass, of course, they, you know, a lot of glasses was recycled, and we mixed. The tank was a what they called a continuous flow. It never stopped. Well, Stuben tank was continuous flow too. Where. Um, they also had another factory that I worked at. It was called BNC Factory. If you, when you walked into, into Main Plant, if you went to the right, you went to uh, the hand shops, and then there were the, there was the automatics, where they made the measuring cups, the custard cups, the big uh, cookware dishes, all out of Pyrex. Wow. Here in Los Island. They used to make the lasagna trays by uh, those big, heavy, thick ones. A lot of those were made by hand. Really? Yeah. They gathered. Sometimes we would gather as many as three gathers in the mold before they would press it down. One, they'd have three gathers, and one guy would start it. He would gather one and drop it in, and the gaffer would cut the glass, cut it off, and he would clean it clean off the the putty head, clean the, the excess glass off, and go back in. And while he was doing that, another guy was already had one gathered, and he would drop it in the mold on top of the other one. He would cut it, and by that time, he had another one ready, and he would drop that one, and the gaffer would press it. So it was... Hot and heavy work. It was... It's too bad. Uh, I don't know how many tapes anybody ever taped it, but it was too bad that... People couldn't really see how it was done because it was how fast they used to go. It was all all piecework. But that was also pulling the plunger by hand. Yep, they pulled that plunger down by hand. They had a, a guy actually on the big jobs had uh, a guy just helping him. He would uh, help the gaffer. The gaffer would would cut the cut the glass and the guy would bring the handle down so the gaffer could reach it. Sure. And then the two of them would squeeze it out. The guy on, was up on one step a little bit higher where he could really put his way down, weight on it and push down hard and the gaffer would be pushed down hard. And they knew just how hard to push and pull <laughs> after doing it you know, for years. It was quite an operation. And then I, so I, I'd never worked on the presses too much, once in a while. And uh, if I worked over or something, but most of the time I, I worked on the German system shops. And then they had the clean iron shops where they only had three to four people working on a shop. And I used to gather these glass funnels. I don't know if you've seen, a, seen these boards in laboratories where they have all the pipes going and they'll have the, the funnel with the little petcock on the bottom so they can turn them off or turn them on. We used to make all, I used to make all different size. I gathered them for my gaffer and uh, we used to get paid by the piece. And the piece work was um, figured out. The gaffer got the most money per piece. Then the gather or the cover on the German system was second highest paid. And then it, it went right down the line. Um, how much skill it took to do your job, and how much you got per piece. How long did it take to work your way 
up to being a gaffer? Um, it was pretty much up to you. Uh, back then, they were, we were in the union, so they were bid jobs. But uh, if you, if a guy couldn't really do the job, if he struggled, they would give him 30 days to learn the job. If they couldn't do it, they would take him off. And if you'd go up and practice uh, on your breaks, and a lot of times the older guys uh, would would help you. They'd see you doing something wrong. They'd say, you know, do this, do that. A lot of it was hands-on. Um, some of the older gaffers wouldn't help you. Some would, it all depend on their personality. And they liked you. If you were a good worker and they liked you, most 90% of them would help you. And I don't think I've ever had one uh, turn me down when I ask them, you know, what I was doing wrong or uh, to come and watch me do one and see if I was doing it right. Most, just about every time, they always, they would help me. So that was the training. Yeah. Nothing formal. So if, if, if you wanted to learn uh, to, to be a gatherer or a, a cover or a ball maker, I mean, it was a pretty much left up to you because uh, the, the foreman wouldn't put you up there on the shop. Uh, the gaffer would have a fit if you couldn't do the job because if you're on German system, if you goof up a piece, you're costing nine guys money. They're, you're messing with their paychecks. Yeah. So a lot of people, a lot of guys, if they couldn't do it, they would usually stop on their own. They wouldn't have to. They would just say, this is, this is not for me. You know, it's... Were there just, other jobs in Corning that they could do, or...? Uh, yeah, uh, a lot of them would leave, leave a factory or go out on the automatics and work or up in B&C factory. Uh, sometimes it would take a, a different job in, it, in, in the hand shops, like um, go, back, go back down and hold mold or crack off. You had people to crack off. You put a blow over on everything, so most everything was uh, broken. The blow over was broken on the edge of the basket, or you took a file and you cracked it off. These baskets kept moving around and they went upstairs and the inspectors up there would take them. By the time they got up there, they were cool because it's quite a ways. They were on the second floor and the, the inspectors would, would look them over. If they were good, they would put them in a box. Then they would, uh, well they, then they would leer them and uh, then they would send them the big flats and they would, the, ap the apparatus down there would do every, any cold work to, or any work to them like add add the um, the pipes coming on to them and stuff like that was all done down there a lot of those guys did work by hand too so they'd have been on the torch rather yeah they did it all on the torches down there we did all we did was work off the irons yeah I actually never watched them go down there and watch them but I seen the end results after they'd taken like one of my funnels that I had made and put, you know, the petcock in the bottom of it and the pipe coming out the side or something like that. They what? could do, they could add it, add or do anything about to it. And we used to make um, milk, what they called dairy jars. They were for uh, milk houses. The uh, milk milking machines would send the, the milk through these pipes and it would come into the milk house and it would go through this big glass ball of glass, you know, this this big jar. And it had a lot of pipes coming in and out of it that, that they'd put in there by hand. And uh, the farmers could tell by the color of the milk or they could draw a little bit out and test it. And uh, now I guess they use all stainless steel and I've talked to some farmers before and they told me they'd much rather have the glass back because they could see by the color, you know, how much the butter content and stuff like that. They did a lot of specialty work. Yeah. You know, it, it was actually, it was hard work 
but you got if you if you worked hard and you did your job right, you made good money. And we worked with a lot of good people. I had a lot of friends. Made friends with a lot of a lot of the guys you worked beside every day. But it was hot. It was hot work. We used to uh, dump cold water on ourselves just to you'd be dry you'd be bone dry in twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> with it, with it. Intense. Air the coming. Air, the the air was like. <laughs> by the time the air got to us, it was it was like coming out of a dryer in the summertime, because I had to go through the top of the you know through the building, because the big fan was out by the river and we were quite a ways away from it. So by the time the air got to where we were, that's warm air. So it felt good to have a coffee can of water dumped over your head. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that wouldn't dry was my shoes. Oh, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> but we would be walk out of there, and we'd we'd all stop throwing water. We used to throw water on each other too, just <laughs> just to, just to keep going. It was. Anybody in particular you remember? Oh yeah, a lot of the guys. Yeah. Um, Gaff. I worked with Gaffer, uh, Harry Yost. Uh, can I, I can mention names? Sure. Harry is a very good gaffer. He's uh, 90, I think he's 93 years old now. So it shows uh, hard work never hurts anybody. And I worked with another very good gaffer by the name of uh, Phil Townsend. And he he just passed away just, just recently. I think he was in his late 80s. And a lot of, most of them are gone now. There's a there, I was pretty. I was only 22 when I started, and a lot of these gaffers were in their late 40s and early 50s when I went in there. So there was quite a bit, quite a bit of age difference. And uh, mo in seniority meant a lot because uh, if you get if somebody retired and stuff, um, seniority. You could bid on, you know, you, by seniority you would move up if you could do the job. If the guy, if somebody moved up and wasn't producing, then they'd go to the next by seniority, which was only right, you know. Sure. I, it's the union way of doing it, and it's a good way to do it. Because if you've been there that many years, you deserve your chance to, to make more money, to be a gaffer. And so my gaffer moved up to a German system once in a while if somebody was off. So I would get to step up in his place and be a gaffer for a while. So it really helped me, helped me learn a lot. And you want me to go on now to Stuben, how I got That's Stuben. great. Well, I, uh, I knew, I heard through the grapevine that they were going to do away with a factory the hand shops. They actually sent it to Brazil and uh, it didn't turn out good over there so it ended up in Sutherland, England and uh, they just closed the plant just not too long ago because the plant manager over there I seen him at the museum and he told me that he had just left England and they would he was there at the closing when they closed the, the plant so I don't know whether they make, we made a lot of beakers and flask for laboratories and stuff like that. The acid bottles, um, we made a, a lot of different size acid bottles. Um, they, I heard that they were um, jacketed with stainless steel. They were glass lined because the acid didn't hurt the glass. Or wood to metal, it would. The Pyrex, right? Yeah, the Pyrex was so strong. And uh, so I heard through the grapevine they were going to do away with uh, a factory. So I took the trades test and um, thought maybe I'd go into trades. And at the time, I decided to go take the trades test. I missed taking the Stuben test by one day. They had a special test for to go to Stuben. 
of the union and had I um, I think every six months they, they gave out these trades tests. So I, I took the mechanical one and passed it and uh, they asked me the next available opening, whether it be a pipe fitter, uh, carpenter, millwright, stuff like that. So they offered me a millwright apprenticeship program. Or, so I, I went into the millwrights and I was in there about seven and a half months and I got laid off. They were cutting back. Um, I quick asked, what were the tests like? Were they um, written? Were they Yeah, it was testing? a written test. Okay. Yeah. They in in the mechanical test they would ask you some mechanical questions about all stuff about fans and I can't remember everything. It wasn't wasn't terribly hard. The Stuben test was one of the the harder tests because uh, they had these circles, and inside the circle was another circle with a little gap in between. And you had to take both hands and draw in the circles in between the two. We're testing two lines. fine motor skills. Right. They're testing your, and I'm right-handed, but um, luckily I. I could do a lot with my left hand, so I did pretty good at it, and I, I passed it. And uh, so you were laid off, you said. <laughs> yeah, I was laid off on the Norwich, and, and I got called a foreman from Steuben. His name is Marty Kedra. He called me, and he said, "I got your name from a foreman in a factory," and he told me that uh, you were one of the uh, young up upcoming glass workers and that I should try to get a hold of you because he heard that I was laid off out of the mill rides. And he said, maybe you can talk him into coming to Steuben. So I went and seen this Marty Kedra and he said, if you will agree to, he said, first off, you gotta go take the test. So I did and I passed it. And he said, now you have to buy Union rule, you have to sign off the millwright for 30 days before I can call you into the Steuben uh, apprenticeship program. So uh, I did. I signed off, and 30 days later, he kept his word. I was working up to Irwin, uh, just doing whatever. And uh, they called and said, uh, you know, you're supposed to report down to Steuben like Monday morning. I went down and uh, they hired me in Steuben, put me in an apprentice program, put me on a shop. And at the time they were putting on quite a few. When I first got hired in Corning in 72, it was right after the flood. So Corning was hiring a lot of people because they were rebuilding a lot of the plants. A lot of, a lot of the plants had already been pretty much redone we're back and running. And um, Steuben was hurting for glass workers. I guess they had a, a bunch of uh, people retire. And business was good. They were selling a lot of Steuben and they needed some, and, he, and I had prior glass working skills, so it kind of puts me ahead of the apprentice that they're hiring. What year was this? In 1983, I went to Steuben, in June of 83. And I got on with a, a gaffer named Jeff Babcock, which is, he's, a, he's about my age. And we were, uh, I already knew how to gather. I could take an iron and go, go gather glass. But I'd never sat in a chair and did it before. In A Factory, we always stood up to blow all our glass. Uh, so I, I never sat down in a chair and actually had to block my own glass. I always blocked it with two hands. Block with one and turn the iron. But I, I picked it up pretty fast, I guess. And, uh, and then, naturally, I wanted to learn more. Glass is very addicting. <laughs> Once you start work, well, you know, you've, you've played around with glass. Once you learn a little bit, you want to learn more. And it just keeps on going. You never, you never know it all. Nobody does. That's really true. Uh, there's some very talented glass workers out there, but they'll 
that if you ask them, they'll tell you, I'm, I can learn off a, a beginner, learn something new that I never thought about trying before. And uh, so I wanted to learn how to cover, you know, or be, a, be what they call a server in Stuben. In A factory, the next man up, they're down from a gaffer. The middle man in, the, in it was called a cover, or in Stuben, they were called a server. They, uh, the gather would get, start to get, go gather the glass, and in, and their glass in Stuben came down. A, it was uh, just one, like one. No, they had two four bays, two four bays that you could gather glass out of, and then they had a tube, a platinum tube that the glass ran down the tube, and it was timed. It had a timer on it, so every time each job, they would figure out how much glass they would need to get a nice even wall, or to get a nice wall for the thickness for the bottom and whatnot. And uh, so when you, every time you went over and got together, you had, you had to do what you call plug it out. They were in a little little round cylinder shape. And you would stick the iron down in, and you'd take it over to the marver, and marver the, the back part down so it was tight to the iron. Then you would take it back to your reheating furnace or a glory hole and heat it up and block it. And we had wooden wooden blocks made of apple wood or cherry wood. And the reason they use fruit wood is because the grain is really dense. And when it burns, it burns away evenly and it doesn't leave any film on the glass. Um, my preference is cherry wood. I always like cherry wood better than uh, apple wood. Apple wood will last a little longer, but the well, cherry wood seems to burn away just a little bit more evener. And uh, so I would do what I was supposed to do to it. You know, the, each job, the gather does different things. You know, like um, I think one of the first jobs I started working on was apples, where I would just uh, plug it out, heat it up, round it up, and uh, hand it to the server. I would. And he, I would cut it down too, so you could get it off the blow iron, or get it off. They were solid, so you could get it off the iron. We have solid irons and blow irons, and then I'd hand it to the server, and he would take and do the bottom, put the crimps in the bottom. And then uh, we had a what we called a oh gosh, I got a mind block here. A stick up, a guy that would stick it up. Um, and or, or um, we had we had quite a few women too that worked out there in Stuben. And um, they would he would stick up the bottom of the apple and break it off the blow iron or the iron, the solid iron. And a lot of times he would do a little work on it, cut off the end if he seen anything on it, and then he would hand it to the gaffer, and the gaffer would put the finishing touches on it. He would poke poke the, the slot in the top, shape it if it needed any more shaping. Usually the server had the shaping all done for him. And he would add the stem and try to you know, burn any dirt off that he could see and cool it down. Then uh, hand, it, hand it off and we had the same person that, that cracked off and everything would carry it and put it into the leer. And you know what a leer is. It's, it's a big. I'll have you tell the camera. The leers uh, are run continuously, and they start out at like 900 degrees, 910 degrees, somewhere in there. And it's a moving belt. It's uh, kind of corrugated. And you have to watch it move, but it moves really slow. And it, the fire, it, it's really hot on one end, and on the other end, it's cold. So what happens is the glass moves down the leer really slow. And by cooling off really slow, it relieves any tension. It, it, makes, it forces the glass to cool evenly. Because if it doesn't cool evenly, it'll crack and break. The thick parts cool slow, the thin parts cool fast. It causes the stress inside the glass. And that, glass is what that stress is what causes the glass to break. So. It's all, the, by experience, they pretty much know 
how long to anneal a piece. Over at the studio, we use the uh, the annealing ovens, and they work about the same way. They they'll they'll run it at 910 degrees for like a half hour, what they call soak cycle. Then they start their way down. And uh, usually a two get a two gather piece takes eight to ten hours to cool down, where you don't have to worry where it'll relieve all the stress. If you're making like a really thick piece, like a big paperweight, you would want to change your cycle to like 20 hours to cool down. The thicker the glass, the longer it should take to cool it. Otherwise, it'll crack. Might not crack then, might not crack for six months, but someday it'll crack if there's stress in it. I've seen pieces uh, I, I've had uh, the weren't stupid, they're were just soda lime glass and had them for six months. And you set them on a TV set, and just the heat from the TV set or something, or a sunlight coming through the window hit it just right. Break for no reason whatsoever. I'm sure a lot of kids have gotten blamed for breaking glass. <laughs> they broke just because it wasn't annealed properly. There's no way to tell. Uh, they do have a, a, a some kind of a scope. I can't think of what it's called. Polariscope. Yeah, I think yeah, where they check the stress in the glass to see if it's being annealed long enough. So I went to Stuben in '83, and I started working working with Jeff on his shop. And uh, bit gather. That's what I was trying to think of. We have a bit gather. They gather the bits like uh, the tusk for an elephant, or they might go get the eyes for for something like a bullfrog or something like that. Any they plus they carry the piece to the to the annealer most of the time or to the to the leer. And uh, they have different jobs they do. They're. A good bit gather is very important on a shop. They have timing. Timing is everything. Because if the piece is too cold or too hot, then you, you can kind of lose. Because timing, uh, even the, ser the server, he times, he has a built-in time clock in his head after a while, after you make a job so long. He knows about how long he has to stay, stay in the heat. And if the bit gather is running slower, or fast, then he has to adjust to that, the server does. And the gaffer will have to adjust. So a good bit gather is very important. Now, everybody's got an important job on a shop. It's a lot like Gay Factory, the same way. One person can make or break a shop. And it's up to the gaffer to get everybody on the same, same timing so you have to have people skills as well as yeah the people hand skills. skills yeah I was always lucky I had good people that worked worked with me that were good workers and that knew knew their glass um and you train them you know I I used to train I trained some apprentices myself and I used to I used to tell them. Uh, I'll, I'll show you what works for me on how to make this job. Then watch somebody else. Just because I'm doing it this way doesn't mean it's the right way or the best way. And then you watch a bunch of people make this job, then you get your own way. I like that. What works for you. Because I'm going to show you what works for me, but I'm not saying that's the right way. That's what I always told my apprentices. Other things <laughs> that you remember uh, telling them? Telling them? Mm, just once in a while, you got to remind them of this or that, and they and they're a big help. They remind you. They'd remind me too. It's like some days you come in and you'd be work. If if you work and you make a job so long, it just comes routine. And you could be thinking about something else and doing your job and still do a good job. And sometimes you can't. 
I'm not really good at my job if somebody comes and talks to me. If I'm working on a piece of glass and somebody comes over and starts talking to me, then sometimes I might forget a step that's very important and I have to try to correct that. They used to, there's an old saying, it's, a, a gaffer is just as, is as good as the glass he can fix. It's not what he can make. It's what he can fix. If somebody else is goofed up and you take it and you, you make it right. I believe that. Yeah, there's a lot of things that way, but it's true in glass working. Um, sometimes you have to make up for somebody else's mistake. If you don't, you're gonna lose a piece. And every, our percentages, everybody has a, a sheet kept on them. And uh, if you don't run 100%, pretty soon uh, somebody's gonna be after you why, asking you why. If it's somebody on your shop that is having struggling, if you if you try, it's your job, it's the gaffer's job to try to get them on, get them going on the right path. But some people it's just hard and you can't. They just have a hard time judging. I never really seen people not try. And then I went to, in 97, 96, I think it was, 96, they come looking for somebody to work at the museum doing the hot glass shows. And they wanted a couple of, they wanted volunteers. And then they were gonna go by seniority because because we were a union, which was the right way to go by seniority. And um, um, I, I thought, well, you know, I'll try it. And the deal was, if you did, if you did go upstairs, at that time at the old the old innovation center um you had to stay at, agreed to stay for a year you just couldn't go up and say work a month and say well i don't like this job and they come up with the idea i think rob Gassetti had a lot to do with it uh, i'm not sure if it was all his idea about showing people how to work glass instead of just letting them come to a museum because most of the time you go to a museum what do you do you just walk around and you look at the pieces and you don't really think, well, what, you, you say to yourself, I wonder how they did that. But you don't really know. They even, will they have a program on TV? Well, well, it's how, did, how, do they, how do they make this or how do they do that? I watch it once in a while. It's interesting Yeah. to watch how they do different, make different things. It's true. And uh, so it was a great idea and it took off uh, I volunteered and uh, they went by seniority and a couple guys with more seniority and I turned it down and I said sure I'll try it for a year and things were slowing down in Stuben so um, at the time they didn't mind they didn't mind losing a couple of gaffers and Donnie I had my own shop and they kind of split my shop up and sent guys here and there and Donnie Donnie Pierce had his own shop and he volunteered, and uh, so Donnie and I went up for a year to try it out. And we liked it, we went, Steve Gibbs also went, and he was our our boss, our, our supervisor. And Steve worked right with us, and Steve knew quite a bit about glass. He worked, did Stuben quite a while. He never did much gathering, you know, but he took it upon himself that uh, during breaks and stuff like that, he would practice. So actually, he he got pretty good at it, and I enjoyed working with Steve. Steve Steve knew what when when we when Donnie and I told Steve something about the the glass or something, he got so he understood what we were saying. It wasn't like you know a lot of supervisors don't have no idea what you're. You could tell them you know. Sure. I can't make that piece because the sun's not shining, you know, and they wouldn't know. Where he knew. He was a good go-between. Right. He, he knew the fundamentals and he knew what, and when we told him we were having trouble with something or something was, wasn't right, 
he would he knew what we were talking about and Peter Drabney also helped us a lot Peter it was a designer at the time but he also is a glass blower himself so and we just worked out of a little little tiny tank and we used to open the door to we didn't have a reheating furnace or a glory hole and we made pieces and Rob the people we found out that the the tourists got the biggest kick out of watching us make the handkerchief bowls. <laughs> Something about that wrinkling up, they just love that. They just fell in love with it. They still do today. It's true. They do. That's, <laughs> I, you know, if you ask people, what was your favorite job in there that you watched them make? And just about 75% always say, the handkerchief faces or the bowls or, or when they walk in and they they see one, they'll say, "I wonder how they did that." You know, it's pretty dramatic. Yeah, to it see is. To change that quickly. How that glass will wrinkle up like that, and not, you know, and very hard to get to identical. The heat has a lot to do with it. The thickness has a lot to do with it. Oh. Um, so I. We stayed the year, and then we decided, uh, they asked us, would you guys like to stay on? And we said, sure. So I stayed there till 2008 when I retired. Did you still go back sometimes? Yeah, um, uh, they call me back. You know, sometimes there's always cases where something happens, an emergency, or somebody vacations. They're sure to help, so they call me back to come in, and I enjoy it, going back. You enjoy the visitors? Yeah. It's nice working at the museum because you meet people from all over the world. It's so much fun to talk to them. I agree. And, I mean, you get, sure, you get asked the same question a lot, but you have to realize uh, the, not the same person is asking you. Somebody knew they just walked in the door and they'll ask it. You know. Sounds like you were a good teacher in all <laughs> these different <laughs> positions. So. <laughs> so it was fun. I mean, you know, like I say, you get asked the same question, but you realize. And our motto was not to let anybody out the door. If they wanted to see Hack last show, we didn't want them to leave without seeing one. If it meant doing back to back shows, that's what we did. And some days we had to do that because we'd have them back clear back across the bridge. And in the when we first started in the old innovation center, that was all on one floor. Oh, that's so all the people had their kids sitting on their shoulders so they could see us. We had a plexiglass, a big wall of plexiglass to protect the people from the glass, any glass that might fly out that way. I mean, uh, then when we moved out over top of the Stuben, where you, Stuben was in the background, it was a lot better. People were close, and they could ask us questions very well. We were working sometimes. The narrator. Yeah. At first, Don and I didn't do any narrating, and uh, George, George Kennedy came in, started working with us, and Darby Webster, and then John Cowden. And George was already a very good glass worker. And uh, Darby had worked glass off and on for Vitrix. And John hadn't, but he'd, he'd worked cold work glass. And so he had a good idea what was going on. So he learned to do a lot of, a lot of things to help out and like that. And sometimes if we were short of help, Steve would jump in and yeah work with us. So I really enjoyed it, working. It was, and like I say, glass, glass is addicting. You, you always want to learn. You making your own work as well? Yes, I do. I, I make my own stuff. I rent time at the studio, and the museum buys a lot of my glass. 
plus I have some other galleries to, to buy glass off me. I enjoy that too. I don't. I don't uh, fill all the order, orders I get actually because I am retired and I don't want to. <laughs> Do other things too. <laughs> yeah, so I, I try to, but sometimes I don't get them filled. But I tell people that in the beginning. I'll say I'll try. I'll try to get you. You know, if somebody wants twenty pieces or something, or um, I'll say I'll, I'll try it. You know, but I can't guarantee you that I, I'm going to get it done because I got other things to do too and and but I, but I enjoy working glass. Mm -hmm. Any other stories worth the last couple minutes? Oh geez, uh, there's a lot of a lot of stories really through the years. <laughs> <laughs> it was always fun. We we got all uh, the tourists used to ask us some funny questions. One day a lady had come up and asked me to if I could fix her glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and they would bring in pieces that were broke, you know. And you hate to tell them, you know, if we, if we heat that piece up and try to fix it for you, it'll probably break in a million pieces. And you're better off to try to have it ground or glue it, you know. And then when you say glue it, they kind of give you that funny look. Like you don't know what you're talking about. Yep. <laughs> but to repair a piece of glass is very hard um, once it's been broke. It depends on where it's broke. Sometimes you can. All oh, depends. That's why I always say, well, let me see it. Then I tell them. Sometimes good news, sometimes bad news. Well, thank you so much. Sure. You told some really fabulous stories.